Great. Well, um, welcome everybody to uh, Antimicrobial Stewardship in Children, um, the afternoon session. Um, my name is Penelope Bryant. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're all meeting today uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I have the dual joy of both chairing this session and also um, doing the first talk. Um, so, uh, I, unfortunately for you, have to introduce myself, but I'll keep it very brief. Um, um, so, I work at the Royal Children's Hospital. I'm an ID physician here, um, and I also work at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and University of Melbourne Department of Paediatrics. I've done training in all sorts of places, but I've ended up here, uh, and my research passions are antibiotics and getting children home. And if I can get children home on antibiotics, then um, that, that, that's my happy, happy place. Um, so uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, World Children's Day was on Friday, which I think is very appropriate uh, for this session. Uh, and I particularly like this picture on the United Nations webpage because most um, uh, photos of children in research are happy, smiling little children. And I love the fact that there's a child sort of on the left there who looks like she doesn't know what's going on and one on the right who looks rather unimpressed to be having their photo taken. Um, and I saw this, uh, this cartoon over the weekend about clinical trials. And I like the fact that uh, it shows researchers champing at the bit to get uh, human subjects. Um, but actually, we know that that isn't actually the case in children. Children often fall far behind in the priorities uh, of research. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, antimicrobial stewardship research uh, is no different. So um, I'm not going to try and cover every um, aspect of antimicrobial research uh, in children today, but what I'm going to do, as it's called an introduction, is um, ask a few questions. So why focus on children independently? What have we discovered to date? Just some examples. What are the research opportunities and what should we do with the findings? So to start with why focus on children independently, to paediatricians this is obvious, it's because they're not little adults. They have developmental and physiological differences. Uh, you see a child, it's pretty obvious what the differences are. Well, sometimes it's obvious what the differences are, um, but they certainly have pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic differences. Um, there's a vast difference in the availability of antibiotics and the choice which we have available to us in pediatrics. Um, the suitability of formulations uh, can be um, uh, quite problematic. Um, uh, there's an assumption in general that children um, prefer taking medicines over tablets, but some of the antibiotic formulations are absolutely disgusting. Um, and there's a lot unknown about dosing in children. There's also a fair degree of diagnostic uncertainty, particularly in little children. Uh, people often describe um, diagnosing children and animals as being similarly difficult. Um, but there are also different outcome measures for children. And then there's a whole other area of research that I'm really not going to talk about at all today. Um, the impact on the early childhood microbiome of any kind of disruptor, of which antibiotics are certainly one. So what makes children special? Um, they have the highest use of antibiotics by age of any age group um, until you get to the very elderly. Um, and by giving antibiotics in a critical growth period, what we're really risking is long-term effects. And we actually don't even know what those long-term effects might be. Um, neonatal antimicrobial resistance is increasing globally um, in NICUs around Australia. And I know that Brendan, who's talking after me, is going to talk about this. There are very high rates of antibiotic use in children uh, in some regions of the world, but there are still relatively low rates of resistance in children in many resource rich countries. Um, however, the rates of antimicrobial resistance are increasing more rapidly in some resource poor countries. Um, and so the opportunity really is to act now. This is a sort of prime moment for us all to seize the day. Um, so moving on to what we've discovered to date. Well, there have been a number of uh, antimicrobial stewardship intervention studies in children, not nearly as many as in adults. Um, but as you can see from this map, they do tend to be uh, located in resource rich areas of the world. Um, on your behalf, I have obviously read all of the literature of all AMS studies to date. Um, and here what I'm really trying to do is to try and show you what has been done, but also where the obvious gaps are. Um, and so I've, really, I've differentiated it between resource rich and resource poor, and then hospital studies, particularly intensive care studies, um, versus community and general practice studies. 
Um, and as you can see, there are a number of different studies which are broadly divided down the left. Um, but if we look at just national policies and national guideline introduction, you can see that actually has been quite a lot of research on this, um, even in resource poor settings, but it's very strongly um, orientated towards hospital uh, settings rather than community and GP settings. Introduction of local bundles uh, and AMS programs. Again, quite a lot of research on in this, but particularly in hospitals and intensive cares and not so much the community. Local guidelines, again, tend to be resource rich hospital settings. Antimicrobial restriction, restriction which we think in the resource rich world is one of the easiest ways of um, uh, managing antibiotic use. Again, quite a lot of uh, research in this area, but almost none in community uh, and general practice. Much less work has been done uh, on behavioral approaches um, to um, changing uh, doctor's practice. Um, very few studies on education alone. Um, not very many studies on audit and feedback. And again, particularly seem to be in resource rich and hospital settings. And then other um, interventions such as microbiology reporting, clinical decision rules, diagnostic tools, quite a lot of gaps and therefore quite a lot of opportunities. And I put other at the bottom uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later of uh, um, thinking outside the box. So if we have a, just a, a look at a few of the studies that have been done and what that tells us so far. It's always difficult when you're listening to a talk. I think it's difficult on Zoom. I think it's difficult in the real world um, to actually listen to a talk where lots of different studies are being described. It's difficult to orientate yourself um, to, um, to what the graph's showing, what the study aim was. Um, so what I've done is to try and put on the screen the orientation in the same way for every different study. So on the left in the green box, um, I put the study aim. Uh, on the right, in a white box, uh, the methods that we used uh, or any additional information. In the middle is going to be the main picture uh, with the main results um, that's as shown as clearly as possible because pictures are, um, are much more helpful to me than text. Um, and then really the take home message uh, in the bottom right hand corner. So. Let's start with a really simple one. So this is a study uh, of implementing local guidelines. So anyone who's ever had anything to do with antimicrobial stewardship will have tried to implement a local guideline at some level. So this is a pre-post intervention comparison of a guideline just simply to reduce vancomycin use in two NICUs in the United States. Uh, and there was a multidisciplinary development of the, um, of the guideline, introduction and a meeting and electronic distribution for use. And as you can see in the middle of the graphs there, it really fairly clearly shows that they decrease their vancomycin use during uh, uh, the, um, after the intervention um, with a concomitant increase in their oxacillin slash fluoxacillin use. Um, but interestingly, it had really very little impact on any of the other um, antibiotic use. I mean, that wasn't their aim, but that's, uh, it's interesting to note it's not, it's not as, um, as simple, just introduce guideline, everything gets better. But they did manage to decrease their vancomycin consumption. What if you don't have a local guideline? Well, there are many national and infectious diseases society guidelines. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about um, one here uh, that I and Brendan and Gab were all uh, involved in um, uh, drafting uh, a few years ago uh, on behalf of the ACID and SPID group. Uh, and this was a systematic review of duration of antibiotics and the timing of switch from IV to oral antibiotics. Um, within the paper, uh, we made a gigantic table of everything that needed to be done. Um, uh, but this obviously is quite hard to read and not everybody's going to be reading a paper. So what we did was to um, then uh, make a very simple, small guideline um, that doesn't look that simple, but uh, a small guideline that would fit onto a lanyard card. And then the next step is to try and implement that, uh, implement that guideline. So um, uh, Brendan is leading a study called SWITCH20, um, which is about the use, uh, if you're not already using it, you, you, if you're already using it, or introduction if you aren't, of the ANSPID ASAP IV oral guidelines in five Australian hospitals. And we're going to produce the guidelines either on a lanyard or via computer. Um, and Brendan and his team have developed um, some education about um, whether the patients are ready to switch from IVs to orals. There's going to be a plan, do, study, act cycle, um, which happens repeatedly using the hospital's existing AMS program and, uh, and extra resources. So the idea behind this study is it's not just enough to have a guideline, you actually have to do research on implementing it. And the whole point of the PDSA cycle is you get to repeatedly iterate and improve the way you do it based on your findings um, as you research it. So there isn't an outcome yet, but watch this space. 
Um, audit and feedback is something that is highly touted in the AMS world um, and has been researched quite extensively. This um, study is from 2012, so quite a long time ago now, by one of our colleagues, Jason Newland in the US. And they did a pre-post comparison after introduction of patient audit feedback uh, at a children's hospital in the USA. And so they looked at selected antibiotics and they looked at prescription um, of these antibiotics identified by their electronic medical record, reviewed by their antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist, and a recommendation was made in real time. And you can see in the table there that list of all the different types of recommendations that they had, um, that the AMS pharmacist and AMS team were uh, made, and then that the outcomes um, in their pre, on the, in the, the white area, and post in the grey area, um, in, introduction of this audit feedback intervention. Um, but it was effective on all antibiotics, but particularly effective on the selected antibiotics. There was a high adherence to the recommendations made by the AMS pharmacist, and they decreased their use of both selected and all antibiotics. And in the conclusion, they said prospective audit and feedback should be the cornerstone of stewardship programs and both physician leadership and pharmacists with expertise in stewardship are crucial for success. Now, that is a true statement, but unfortunately, what that requires is an electronic medical record and resources for an antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist and an antimicrobial stewardship physician to lead that. And that is not available <clears throat> in every setting. It's not available in all community settings. It's not available in um, low and middle income countries all the time. It's not even even available in all um, high resource settings. So the gold standard isn't always the thing that we can use. So what about simpler things? So this is a study of a very simple pre-post comparison of an education intervention in five uh, child community healthcare centers in Israel. And this was just a one day seminar for pediatric prescribers on the judicious use of antibiotics for upper respiratory tract infection. And as you can see from their results tables, their rates of antibiotic use significantly reduced after the um, education intervention and their rates of appropriate use of antibiotics um, significantly uh, increased um, in uh, acute otitis media and pharyngitis tonsillitis. So it was a really simple intervention and they both decreased their antibiotic usage and increased their appropriateness. Um, so the there are very few studies in uh, low and middle income countries. So I've chosen this one that was uh, an intervention uh, comparison as an Indonesian teaching hospital for two reasons. One to show that, um, show a study for, from a low and middle income country, but also to show the concept of implementing AMS bundles. So a bundle is a term uh, literally just to mean a number of different um, interventions at the same time. And this was an antimicrobial stewardship and infection control bundle. Um, and so the, the methods they used, they used the existing WHO handbook because they didn't have their own guidelines. Uh, and from that, they made a checklist um, uh, for which people could remind themselves what to do. Um, they laminated some antibiotic charts and then gave some periodic feedback. So they didn't have the resources to give daily feedback or patient-centered feedback. Um, and you can see fairly clearly that um, uh, after their intervention started, their rates of hospital acquired infections uh, decreased dramatically. Now that was their primary outcome, um, but they also decreased their inappropriate antibiotic use and decreased their mortality. Um, and it doesn't, it's, it's tricky because you don't know which of the things was most effective, but e individually, each of those things may not have been that effective. And the advantage of a bundle and doing things together um, is to increase the efficacy um, of your intervention. So what we know from AMS research to date is that there are small pockets of good evidence in children. Um, and a lot of this evidence is similar things that we do in adults. Um, and so we don't need to keep uh, asking ourselves, do some of these things work? Um, however, uh, and the research that was the best is research targeting local barriers. Um, but the research questions obviously have to be done according to resources. If you don't have an electronic medical record, there's no point asking a research question that needs it. Um, and the research findings are fairly specific to um, the locations um, that they've been, um, uh, that the questions have been asked in. So what are the research opportunities? Um, well, as you can see from that table that I did, there are many, many, many opportunities. Uh, and I think this is where everybody should be excited. Um, not excited by the size of the knowledge gaps, although they are many and manifold, um, but really to understand that um, there, there is room for everybody to be researching in this area. 
Um, so there are knowledge gaps in antimicrobial use. Um, we don't know who is taking which antibiotics. We don't know who's prescribing them. We don't know for what infections. We don't really even know what antibiotic usage measure we should be using. In children, you can't use defined daily dosage because children are different sizes. And so there's lots of um, uh, work at the moment being done on trying to, trying to work out the right measure. Um, uh, we don't really know what the right AMS outcomes should be uh, in pediatric research. Clostridium difficile is very common in children under the age of two, about 50% of children have uh, C. difficile in their stool, so it's not a very useful, out useful outcome measure in children. And on the other end of the scale, um, invasive infection and death um, are uncommon in children, so again, that's not a very useful outcome measure. What we often end up using is um, days of antibiotic therapy or days in hospital or days in intensive care. Um, and those are useful measures, um, but they're very resource intensive if you don't have an electronic medical record. Um, another um, uh, useful AMS outcome uh, that we often use in children is appropriateness. Um, but even that is not always clear what the right measure of appropriateness is and making sure that um, it's standardized across different studies. Antimicrobial resistance is a lot not known in children. Um, because invasive um, AMR bacteria are not very common, we're often more looking at uh, colonizing bacteria. And colonizing AMR bacteria in children, something that's very understudied, um, and they potentially represent a huge reservoir of AMR bacteria um, because they are sneezing, snotting, vomiting, pooing creatures who like to spread their, um, uh, their um, colonizing bacteria uh, between, between themselves and us, um, and, and that could be a particular, um, a particular concern that we are so far unaware of. We don't really know what causes resistance in children. Um, we uh, know broadly that overuse of antibiotics causes resistance, but we don't really know exactly what antibiotics in children exactly. Is it duration of antibiotics? Is it whether it's IV antibiotics? Is it spectrum of antibiotics? Is it number of different courses in the first few years of life? We just don't know. Uh, and importantly, um, we don't even know who has resistance and where it is. Um, so uh, I was uh, fortunate to participate in the antibiotic chapter in the third atlas, uh, third Australian atlas of healthcare variation a couple of years ago, um, and we looked at um, antibiotic prescribing uh, by um, GP and community prescribers across um, LGAs across Australia. Um, and between the lowest prescribing LGA and the highest prescribing LGA, there was a 16 fold difference in antibiotic prescribing rate. Um, and and it, was, it was high across the board. It was um, one, one course of antibiotics for every single child under the age of 10 in Australia um, that year, which, which is a high rate of antibiotic prescribing. And we know that antibiotic prescribing rates in children are high in Australia. Um, but how does that relate to resistance, which is the thing that we're all worried about? Well, again, we really don't know. So um, a colleague of mine um, uh, did a systematic review of community antimicrobial resistance research in children, and it's very thin on the ground. Um, the vast majority of it has been done in the United States or Europe um, with a smattering of places elsewhere. So we are trying to uh, do some discovery research at the moment. Um, we are about to start a, program, a research study called Viva La Resistance. Um, I actually hope not Viva La Resistance, but um, uh, it just sounded like a fun name, uh, where we are mapping uh, resistance in children um, across the Melbourne greater metropolitan area, um, and then to try and um, associate that through data linkage with um, the antibiotic prescribing rates uh, as, in, as in the atlas. And we hope then that we'll be able to associate those two uh, risk factor, the risk factor of antibiotic prescribing to um, antibiotic resistance, and then looking at a whole host of other risk factors at the same time. The other thing, uh, the other opportunity that arises for children is for us to think outside the box um, and think of new ways uh, to try and um, improve antibiotic use. And so there are many different ways that we can think about this, but um, uh, I, I've chosen to think about it as in, as in replace, so replacing uh, IV with oral antibiotics, replacing broad with narrow antibiotics. Relocate, this is my particular passion, this is relocating children out of hospital uh, and into the home uh, for their antibiotic um, administration. Uh, reduce, so reducing, we always think about reducing the spectrum of antibiotics, but even reducing the duration of antibiotics. Repurposing old antibiotics um, that we may have given up on because of their side effects, but actually which are very useful in the fight against antibiotic resistance. Relabeling children with antibiotic allergy who then end up on much broader spectrum antibiotics to actually not having antibiotic allergy. 
Um, oh, I don't know how that one got in there. So I'm going to give a couple of examples uh, of some work that we've done um, uh, at the Children's Hospital and Murdoch um, Institute of, uh, of particularly looking at these things. So um, one of um, the things we've tried to do is replace IB with oral antibiotics. Um, and clinical decision rules um, uh, are used a, a bit in uh, pediatrics. Uh, I know that Gab's going to talk a little bit um, about this um, in her talk uh, around um, febrile neutropenia and antibiotic decision making. Um, this was a study that we did uh, looking at clinical decision rules, uh, a clinical decision rule trying to um, decrease the amount of IV antibiotics that we use for cellulitis. Um, and so this was done by my PhD student, Dr. Leila Ibrahim, uh, and it involved um, uh, those features that I've written there. First of all, defining a gold standard uh, and then comparing each different clinical feature that we might associate it with cellulitis um, and then trying to work out which are the fewest number of features that give us the best predictive um, value um, and then using a cutoff um, for when IVs should be used. And what this resulted in was the ASSET score, which is an acronym for Area Systemic Features, Swelling, Eye Involvement and Tenderness, um, and uh, with a score for each, uh, and particularly um, using the hand as being uh, in children the, well, and in adults too, but the hand is 1% of the whole body surface area. So the, rather than trying to work out body surface area with measurements, which is difficult and often people can't find the tape measure, um, it's just to use the child's hand and say if it's bigger than a child's hand, it scores a one. Uh, if you have fever, you score a one. If you have severe swelling, you score a two. If you have periorbital involvement, you score a one. And if it's tender, you score a two. And anything with four or more, any child who scores four or more um, gets IV antibiotics. Um, uh, so that uh, initial study has been done and now we are um, uh, looking at the impact of implementing it. Um, so as I said before, my passion is um, relocating uh, antibiotics. So I'm very fortunate at the Children's Hospital because um, we have a large and active uh, hospital in the home program. Um, and um, uh, one of, uh, one of um, the trainees um, had a look at um, using antimicrobial stewardship within our, um, uh, within our program. And she looked at the years of uh, appropriateness of antibiotics, so appropriate is purple, um, uh, and looked at it pre-formal infectious diseases input and after we started um, uh, having infectious diseases input into every antibiotic decision. Uh, and it clearly shows that you can intervene and improve your appropriateness um, of uh, outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy. But then we wanted to go one step further and say, are the children who are currently being treated in hospital who um, would be better off not being treated in hospital? And this led to the choice trial, care at home or inpatient for children in emergency. And I actually haven't done my little green and white and blue boxes here because I actually thought I'd rather do a little animation. Um, so this is a little boy, turns up to the emergency department. Um, and then um, the, decision, uh, the decision tree was whether these children uh, could then have to stay in hospital and receive intravenous fluproxacillin or go home and receive uh, intravenous fluproxacillin, sorry, intravenous keftriaxone. And somehow 188 families let us flip a coin to say whether their child would be admitted to hospital or not and go home. Um, and the outcome of this, this is a non-inferiority study with the primary outcome treatment failure. And we were really just trying to look at is um, treatment failure um, uh, at home uh, no worse than, than in hospital. But what we found out is it wasn't just no worse, um, it was actually better. You're more likely to successfully complete your treatment if you went home. You were more likely not to have adverse events if you went home. Children were happier at home. It was cheaper for families if they were at home. It was cheaper for the hospital if they're at home. Even parents were happier at home. So everything, every single parameter we looked at was better at home. Aha, you say, but you use keftriaxone and not fluproxacillin. And so that's a really um, important thing that as a lot of um, uh, hospital in the home and outpatient conventions and, con and conferences, uh, we talk about keftriaxone and people talk about it as being evil. So we thought, well, we, that's what we need to study. The whole point of this is not just that at home should be better, but that we shouldn't be risking um, antibiotic resistance. And we found that there was no difference in uh, acquisition of MRSA, ESBLs, or Clostridium difficile between the two um, different arms of the study. So keftriaxone has a bad name for good reason um, in, with long durations and intensive care um, settings. But for home settings for a couple of days, there was no difference. 
Um, the reason I put this is um, for the first and maybe only time in my life, uh, a study that I've been involved in made it onto the front cover of the Lancet Infectious Diseases, but also so that I could show you this slide which I made, which shows my other passion, which is animation. And I spent probably as much time doing this animation as I did writing the uh, original paper. Whatever makes you happy. Um, and so finally, what should we do with the findings? Um, so the um, uh, traditionally, we think about translation as you have a child um, that you ask a question about. Um, the question is, for example, can we get this child home? You design a trial, you do the trial, you get your results. And then the absolute key is how do you get your results back into the clinical setting? So um, one very important way to do this is to think about how you're going to get your results back into the clinical, set, clinical setting right from the start. And you can do this by using program logic. Now, this is a, a concept that I only uh, came across a couple of years ago, but I think it's a, a helpful and useful way of thinking about all research, actually, but particularly in this um, talk on anti, um, antimicrobial stewardship research in kids. So the way, if you haven't come across it before, that you, to think about it is you think about what your problem is. So here, antibiotic use and misuse in children causes long-term harm, antibiotic resistance, life impact effects, potentially via the microbiome and economic impacts. And what you want your long-term solution to be is to reduce inappropriate use and reduce antibiotic resistance. And the way to get there is to think about it in terms of medium-term outcomes and short-term outcomes. So your medium-term outcomes might be about five-year goals. Um, so what you're looking is to impact on antibiotic guidelines, to implement AMS strategies, and impact on antibiotic policy. But to get to those five-year goals, you need some short-term outcomes, which are the goals, um, the outcomes from your individual research studies. So you want to understand the association between antibiotic use and harms. We want to know the effectiveness of different AMS strategies because they're usually not compared. We want to know about improved dosing. We want to understand the antibiotic effect on the microbiome. So to get to these short-term outcomes, you need some stakeholders and some inputs and some activities. So stakeholders, we think about children, we think about their parents, the prescribers, the local researchers you might already research with, but also collaborators within and between institutes and countries, and also involving your policymakers from the beginning. Um, you want specific expertise, local resources, networks, administrative support, which is, I can't recommend highly enough, and of course funding. And then there are so many different activities which really fit into all of those different sort of gaps in the table where the opportunities are. Um, surveillance, birth cohorts, clinical trials, health services research, microbiome analysis, data linkage. And at the bottom I've included very importantly translation strategies and communication strategies right from the beginning, not thinking about at it at the end. And so one of those translation strategies is guidelines. Um, and so the RCH clinical pra practice guidelines have been running for a number of years. Um, and um, with the results from the choice trial, um, we engaged with them and I'm sorry, uh, we engaged with them uh, and the ambulatory or HIF use of IV antibiotics for cellulitis is now in that guideline. Now, it's not just enough to have a guideline, um, it's also important to disseminate your guideline and the RCH clinical practice guidelines have now extended um, to the Pediatric Improvement Col Collaborative, which started off um, just at RCH and then became the statewide guidelines of Victoria. And now the Pediatric Improvement Collaborative Collaborative is across the whole of the Eastern Seaboard, and then eventually, I'm sure, Australia and the world. Um, so in summary, um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, we can implement what we already know, and there's already some good data out there. But there's discovery research needed of basic measures of antibiotic use and resistance. We need to define our research outcomes. We need more research in low and middle income countries, and more research challenging dogma and thinking outside the box. Um, and then finally, impact through planning and communication. And I'm going to finish with a little video that we made um, of our research um, at, uh, at the MCRI, which is really about communicating with stakeholders. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I realised lastly that I forgot to add the duration of the uh, of the <clears throat> uh, the animation uh, onto my talk, so I've gone a little bit over. I'd like to acknowledge the people on that list, um, and I'm going to stop sharing um, so that I can uh, see if there are any questions. So there aren't, which is great. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Anna, for saying great animation. Uh, I probably should have just put up the animation and let Gab and Brendan do all the talking. So um, what are, what's, um, if anybody uh, has any, um, uh, any other questions that they think of during, uh, during Brendan or Gab's talks, so I'm very happy to take them. But what I'd like to do now is to um, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Brendan McMullen, uh, who is uh, one of my colleagues who works at Sydney Children's Hospital and the University of Melbourne. He's also a paediatric infectious diseases specialist. Um, and he um, and microbiologist working at Sydney Children's and he's a conjoint senior lecturer in the School of Women's and Children's Health at New South Wales. I'm not going to take up too much of his time except to say that his research interests include antimicrobial stewardship and resistance and he's currently completing a PhD with the um, National Centre for Infections in Cancer at the Peter McCallum Centre and University of Melbourne. Go Brendan. Thanks very much Penelope. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Um, and look, I'm yeah, just going to have, just sorry. Thing, sorry. Uh, we can see um, the presenter view. If you click on uh, swap display at the top. Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Arjun. Okay. Perfect. Is that now. better? Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. And yes, I'm going to have that lovely tuba um, uh, umpa baseline in my head for the rest of the day. And that is, that is not a bad thing. Um, so um, I don't have any uh, conflicts to declare, um, but I am involved um, with these organizations on the right and with these um, uh, organizations and um, groups uh, here, which is informing to some extent what I'm, I'm talking about. So I, um, I'm going to be discussing a number of things with which I've been involved with. Arjun said uh, I can shameless, shamelessly talk about a lot of the research I've been more recently um, involved in. And I've got an e much easier task than Penelope because I'm allowed to concentrate on the Australian setting. So we'll get into it. Um, I um, refuse to acknowledge that I have too many hats, but unfortunately I don't have a hat um, like these ones yet. So what I'm going to talk today um, are mainly about uh, some barriers and opportunities uh, in antimicrobial stewardship and use in children from uh, Australian national surveillance data. Um, then I'm going to move on to going through some uh, new aspects um, that we have available and new resources from guidelines uh, and AMS materials. Uh, and then I'll move on to some active interventional and implementation research in AMS and antimicrobial stu uh, stewardship uh, in the Australian paediatric setting. So I will have a, a mainly a hospital uh, focus uh, in this setting. There's also some excellent stuff that's happening in community settings, which I think you have heard about already in this webinar series. So Penelope's already mentioned um, the excellent third Australian Atlas of healthcare variation with substantial 
variability in the prescribing rates for children nine years and under um, and with on average one child receiving a, an antibiotic prescription every year. So antibiotic use in this population is substantial both in the community and the hospital setting. At the Ansford ASAP, so the Paediatric Special Interest Group of ACID, the Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases, uh, the antimicrobial stewardship um, particular group of that um, um, produced these excellent uh, studies uh, from um, surveys conducted principally in, in 2012, looking at antimicrobial use in all children in hospitals, uh, as well as children in neonatal units from some tertiary hosp paediatric hospitals and neonatal units across uh, five states of Australia. Uh, and in each of these studies, there was substantial antimicrobial use with almost half of the, uh, the children or neonates receiving antibiotics. And there was substantial variability in appropriateness and guideline concordance. Uh, so recently, a group of us uh, looked um, at antimicrobial use in hospitalised children um, across uh, institutions that admitted children and performed NAPS surveys across the country. So this was a point prevalence survey analysis from participating facilities um, for surveys conducted between 2014 and 2017 inclusive. We looked at hospital facilities of all different types from small um, rural hospitals all the way to principal referral hospitals and specialist uh, tertiary paediatric hospitals. And the main outcomes were prescribing, antibiotic prescribing use and appropriateness and factors associated with inappropriate prescribing. So all in all, there were over 6,000 prescriptions among nearly 4,000 children from about 250 facilities and inappropriate prescribing overall occurred in almost 20%. But there were some interesting differences in the rates of inappropriate prescribing. So there was more inappropriate prescribing in the non-tertiary paediatric centres, so a 37% greater odds of inappropriate prescribing in those uh, facilities. And in a non-major city hospital location um, compared with major city hospital location studies, uh, sorry, settings, there was a 52% in increase in odds of inappropriate prescribing. And there was less inappropriate prescribing in groups that perhaps had more access to specialised resources uh, and facilities, such as neonates, um, immunocompromised children, and those admitted to intensive care units. Um, and I should say that the neonates in this study were mainly those um, in neonatal intensive care units rather than those on postnatal wards um, uh, being prescribed sepsis, uh, antimicrobial therapy empirically for neonatal sepsis. We also found that restricted uh, antimicrobials that were prescribed but not approved were significantly more likely to be inappropriate with a staggering odds ratio of almost 13 uh, for inappropriateness. And similar to what has been shown in many adult studies but hadn't really been um, comprehensively shown in uh, pediatric studies across the country, surgical prophylaxis was inappropriate in more than half of prescriptions. So indicating there's still a way to go in improving that. Um, I know you've heard a lot about the surgical naps um, in an earlier session. So we concluded from this study that inappropriate prescribing was common and there were opportunities for targeted interventions in diverse settings with perhaps um, a need for policy targets in those settings with fewer resources. Uh, such as in rural versus metropolitan settings and targeting um, opportunities for paediatric AMS um, uh, outside dedicated children's hospitals um, as well as within them. We found that um, an antibiotic approval system where, where drugs are approved are certainly associated with appropriate prescribing and that highlights the importance of these. And we also concluded that the actual NAPS methodology was a useful data set to analyse antimicrobial prescribing hospitalised children and identify targets for improvement. So after that, we decided to look uh, at a couple of other high risk settings of antimicrobial use and, and prescribing in children. And we started with a neonatal sepsis group next. 
So just to uh, bring to light that the neonatal period is the most vul vulnerable time of life across the board, and neonatal mortality accounts for almost half of deaths in children under five years globally. Unfortunately, clinical signs of neonatal sepsis are often very nonspecific, and so empiric antibiotic therapy, which can be life-saving, is commonly prescribed. So in this study, we decided to report on neonatal sepsis using a similar national data set from Australia. So once again, we uh, included point prevalence surveys from facilities participating in the NAPS. Um, this time uh, we were able to include 2018, so it was 2014 to 2018, a five-year um, survey um, a sampling frame. Uh, hospital facilities of all types were eligible for inclusion and participants had to be neonates who were less than 28 days um, on the day of audit, who were admitted to those facilities and prescribed antimicrobials for a recorded sepsis indication. And the main outcomes, um, again, were prescribing use and appropriateness, but we also focused on the most common drugs prescribed in our analysis. And so all in all, uh, this was a little over 400 prescriptions in a little over 200 neonates from 39 hospitals. So what was interesting about this was we found that gentamicin and benzyl penicillin alone accounted for almost 80% of prescriptions. But the top five of anti top five antibiotics that you see here, so including kepitaxium ampicillin and flucloxacillin, accounted for over 90% of neonatal sepsis prescriptions. Despite this, there was substantial variation in dosing of these drugs. Um, so displayed here, you can see that the, the median gentamicin dose was five milligrams per kilo, but there were um, doses as low as two milligrams per kilo being given and as high as eight milligrams per kilo. And um, similarly for penicillin, there was a substantial amount of dosing. Um, variation. And the variation um, in gentamicin dosing wasn't random. There was a, a significantly lower dose in the non-specialist hospitals in, in, and in rural hospitals compared with metropolitan hospitals. And so this non-random variation um, and the variation in use of really a handful of drugs, I think, op offers opportunities for improved standardization and understanding wh where that variation arises from. Additionally, although um, these drugs were commonly prescribed, only 4% of the neonates at the time of study had microbiologically confirmed infection. And that's in keeping with some other studies of neonatal sepsis elsewhere. And this um, indicates that there really is an opportunity, even in the Australian well-resourced setting, to improve prescribing and reduce that unnecessary variation for neonatal sepsis by targeting um, improving this for just a small number of drugs. Okay, next we decided to look at antimicrobial use in immunocompromised children. So um, Gab is going to talk later about the picnic study uh, which she leads. Um, and this is a multi-site Australian study that's NHMRC funded designed to validate some clinical decision rules for stratifying febrile neutropenia into risk of serious bacterial infection. But the picnic study also collected really rich data on antimicrobial usage, um, which could be linked with outcomes. So in this study, there were 858 episodes of febrile neutropenia in eight centres across Australia. Um, and the most common antimicrobial prescribed was piperacil and tazobactam. Um, accounting for 60% of prescriptions, but again, there was substantial variation. And about 30% of children received a prescription for aminoglycosides, again, 30% of episodes as well. Uh, in 6.3% um, or 54 episodes, there was an unfavourable outcome, and this was a composite outcome of death, ICU admission, relapse of infection or late onset sepsis. Um, death fortunately was rare, but unfortunately did occur um, for four children. Um, however, there was an adjusted hazard ratio of this unfavorable outcome in those prescribed aminoglycosides um, with a hazard ratio of almost four, as you can see there. And so from this study, once again, I think you're gonna 
see a common theme here. There is substantial variation in antibiotic prescribing um, uh, in this group as well, paediatric febrile neutropenia within Australia. Um, even though you might think this is a group where you could really standardize the management um, of infections. Also, somewhat surprisingly, early aminoglycoside use appeared harmful overall. Uh, and despite that, it's recommended in various ways in febrile neutropenia guidelines in various jurisdictions. There isn't, however, a standard national paediatric febrile neutropenia guideline. Uh, and so we concluded that further efforts should be uh, undertaken to standardise recommendations for this condition, um, as well as establishing what is the role for amino empiric aminoglycosides. Okay, so we've identified um, from some recent national studies that there, are, there, are, there is substantial variation in practice. Um, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? What do we have in terms of resources for paediatric antimicrobial stewardship and use? So here's some work um, led by Penelope Bryant um, and um, uh, also very ably assisted by Natalie Morgan um, and some others, um, in, including a small contribution from me. Um, and in this study, um, uh, we surveyed 106 hospitals across the country um, and once again found substantial rural and metropolitan disparities in antimicrobial stewardship resources. Um, but the study was also designed to um, uh, look at barriers to improving antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and so although uh, only half of um, uh, hospitals overall had locally adapted um, empirical antibiotic prescribing guideline, there were real uh, standout um, uh, um, common barriers in terms of uh, the type of barriers that people perceived. So there were some discrepancies between um, the rural, regional, metropolitan and tertiary sites, but really the commonest perceived barriers overall for successful AMS programs were a lack of dedicated um, infectious diseases and microbiology services suitable for paediatric AMS, lack of dedicated pharmacy resources and a lack of education for clinicians in antibiotic use. So once again, room for improvement. Okay, I would argue now that there actually is some light on the end of, at the end of the tunnel because we do have some um, relatively recently introduced, introduced guidelines and resources which I think um, can be used to inform policy to educate our clinicians uh, and to improve antimicrobial prescribing practice for children. So um, you'll all be familiar with Therapeutic Guidelines Antibiotic. Uh, these are um, essentially national therapeutic guidelines that are available to clinicians practicing in hospitals across the country and now increasingly uh, available to general practitioners and practitioners in, in primary care, although there's still some work to do there. But in 2019, they underwent a major update um, with greatly expanded information on prescribing um, for infections in children and uh, included increased information on duration, but also now contains greatly expanded information on, on antimicrobial stewardship considerations, including in the community setting. Um, and this importantly includes strategies for general practice and IV oral uh, switch, which as Penelope uh, pointed out in the earlier session, is so important for improving the welfare of children uh, who need to receive antibiotics. The new content included um, uh, empirical therapy for neonates with early onset um, uh, or late onset community sepsis. Um, for the first time, these are the first antibiotic recommendations for neonates, as well as for these other conditions you can see here. So, um, and this is just an example. So if you want to look further, you can um, review a list of new updates in the link there. Uh, this year, uh, it's impossible to ignore the fact that we've all been affected by COVID um, and there has been a national task force um, for uh, reviewing, rapidly reviewing the evidence for, for COVID and providing recommendations to clinicians across Australia um, and even beyond. Uh, these guidelines have been reviewed by people around the world, in fact. The guidelines have a, um, a fairly uh, exciting living evidence model 
um, which is designed to respond rapidly to emerging research and no research is emerging more rapidly at the moment, as you'll appreciate, than COVID research. Um, uh, but the methodology is extremely robust in terms of evidence synthesis and guideline development. It's multidisciplinary and it's endorsed by key stakeholder organisations um, across the country. It has consumer input, it has great uh, commitment to diversity and equity. And very importantly, it includes therapeutic recommendations for COVID-19 in children, including PIMS-TS. So it is fantastic uh, as a child health provider to have a seat at the table in this really important activity in 2020 and moving into 2021. There's also the Australasian Neonatal Medicines Formulary, uh, or ANMF, which used to be known as Neomed. So this provides evidence-based information to support clinicians in the de delivery of treatment for neonates. It also has a, a rapid a review process with rapid capacity for evidence-based practice updates. It's um, routine in New South Wales, neonatal intensive care units, and I understand has um, essentially been adopted by uh, NICUs uh, throughout the country. Um, there are also international collaborations. Um, and importantly, the protocols are freely available online, but um, in a format that's easy to print as a hard copy with version control for site specific use. And uh, protocols are available for most commonly used antimicrobials now, as well as a host of other drugs. ANSPED, which I mentioned before, continues to be a really strong uh, special interest group within ACID, uh, representing uh, paediatric infection management across Australia and New Zealand. It's had a very strong online presence during this COVID era, era including input into national guidelines. But also uh, ACID, as you uh, have heard, I, I think in earlier talks, has um, been involved in multiple very higher uh, stakes collaborative studies across the world, such as Merino and Camera 2. Pediatrics has not been neglected in this space, so there are multiple collaborative studies um, ongoing now that involve children um, in the treatment of children with serious staphylococcal infections, including Cassette and SNAP, which I'll touch on later. And there are many other studies involving antimicrobials in process. Also, uh, just um, in the last month, the Australian Commission has published its paediatric chapter. Uh, so this is a paediatric chapter of the a very well-respected uh, AMS handbook um, for the first time. And it includes information specific for um, child health providers on drivers of antimicrobial use in children, AMS strategies, uh, and some indicators for benchmarking. And this is uh, extremely important um, because as we've heard, children are not little adults and we need to tailor our AMS programs uh, uh, to make them suitable for them. Okay, in the concluding part of this session, I'm just going to touch on a few, I think, highlights of uh, AMS research um, that are happening in Australia in addition to, to some of the studies Penelope's already mentioned uh, and uh, what Gab is going to talk about later. So um, I think Penelope has um, talked about this study um, better and uh, with um, a better use of animations than I could. But I would like to highlight the significance of this study. So not only was it published in the Lancet ID, which is a, obviously a very reputable publication, but it's so important to measure outcomes, including antimicrobial resistance uh, type outcomes. So this study received well-deserved publicity uh, and I think uh, has uh, set a benchmark for how we conduct these sorts of uh, antimicrobial intervention studies um, in our setting. Um, I mentioned Staph aureus before, and this is just to highlight that uh, in children, as well as in adults, Staphylococcus aureus is a common cause of bacteremia. Um, but despite this, less than or fewer than 300 children worldwide have ever been randomly assigned into clinical trials to, to assess the efficacy of therapy. So the CASSETTE trial um, uh, has been running for a little while now. Um, this is a, a multi-centre uh, investigator-initiated RCT, um, a pilot RCT which compares adjunctive clindamycin 
um, in addition to standard antibiotics for the treatment of severe Staph aureus infection. Um, it enrolled both adults and children uh, and analysis is underway. So that is an achievement in itself, um, but importantly, Cassette has also uh, fed into uh, future studies such as SNAP. So SNAP stands for the Staphylococcus aureus Network Adaptive Platform. And this is a trial that is about to begin that aims to improve treatment outcomes really across the board for patients with Staphylococcus aureus bloodstream infections. It's a, a pragmatic adaptive trial design. It's an international collaboration, though is um, Australian led um, with involvement of, of um, many people um, uh, who you'll know who've been working in, in this field across the country. Uh, and very importantly, this, this study is designed to enrol both adults and children, including neonates. So we hope to get that number of uh, children enrolled in trials to quite a bit more than 300 within the next year. Okay, so um, I think my conclusions from this setting are there are definitely gaps and barriers in antimicrobial stewardship and use of antibiotics for children in Australia. And I think research into exactly where those gaps um, occur are important for us targeting future research as well as policy. Um, making guidelines uh, and targeted resources available, I think also allow for benchmarking and for measuring improvement as has never been available before. And um, I guess one of the uh, themes of this presentation is just to point out that Australian uh, researchers are really at the forefront in multiple domains of paediatric antimicrobial research, even though there's a lot more still to do. Uh, so um, I understand this talk's being recorded, so I'll just uh, display these in case people want to look up the references. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, all the people I've collaborated with uh, uh, on this research and to the many other people who are doing excellent research in this space. Thank you very much, Brendan. That was uh, that was excellent as always. Um, so Arjun has popped a uh, a question in the chat to both you and me. So I'm going to let you take it first. <laughs> okay. Um, and it says, what can be expected in relation to the time that it takes to translate um, a quality improvement finding or initiative uh, into practice across the sector? What's your experience of research to practice translation been? Yeah. That is an excellent question and a very timely one. So before this year, I would have said that, look, it takes several years, rounds of um, surveys, graded studies, uh, long discussions that happen with flying people in and out of places to turn into guidelines to translate this kind of research into practice. But I think that's been challenged this year by COVID. We have shown that if we have sufficient will uh, and sufficient get sufficient policymakers and stakeholders around the table, we can translate research into practice extremely quickly. So I think how quickly these things um, are translated into practice is a, um, a question of resources, um, a question of um, uh, engagement, uh, and, uh, and a, a question of will. So what I am hopeful that one of the, um, good things that can come out of the trash fire that is 2020 is we have learned not only, you know, how terrible things can be, but also what we are capable of um, if we have the will and work together. Yes, yeah, so I 100% I, um, I agree. And, and I think the question also included um, such as HIF. And I think uh, that, that um, uh, Brendan's uh, answer is absolutely right. But it, and it also depends on what the, the bit that he said in the middle, which is it also depends on resources. So if you have a um, quality improvement um, uh, initiative that requires relatively low resources, even if it requires lots of people, they can all come together on Zoom. That's a, that's an amazing thing. Um, but if you have something that does require a reasonable amount of resources, such as if you don't have a HIF to having a HIF, that's that's obviously going to take a little bit longer. Um, but a lot of what those resources require is will, and as long as you have will, um, there's you, it usually doesn't take that long to get the um, uh, the findings into practice. Um, so for HIF, for example, you might need to um, write a business case to increase your 
number of nursing staff who can go out on the road to make your HIF um, able to be responsive enough to take patients from the emergency department directly, which is what the cellulitis study uh, um, uh, obviously requires. Um, but it's, um, I agree with Brendan, it's a lot faster than it used to be. And part of it is understanding what you need and which stakeholders you need to get involved um, to make those things happen. So it could be, could be a little bit longer, but can certainly be, uh, I would say, some of these things have reduced from from months to weeks and from years to months. So, uh, so I think everything has got a lot faster. All right, Brendan, thank you very much indeed. So we'll now move on to uh, uh, to Gab. Um, and please uh, continue to put any questions for Gab uh, and or Brendan and myself um, for the end of Gab's talk. So. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Heusler um, is a team leader in the Clinical Pediatrics Research Group um, at the MCRI and, uh, like me, an infectious diseases physician at the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, she's also a postdoc researcher um, with, uh, national, with the National Center for Infections in Cancer um, and also has clinical appointments at Peter Mac and the Pediatric Integrated Cancer Service. Um, so her PhD and her postdoctoral work continues to focus on uh, management of febrile neutropenia uh, in Australia and worldwide. And I will hand over to Gab. Thank you. Thank you, Penelope. And thank you very much to the organisers for the opportunity to speak today. So there'll be a little bit of overlap with some things that um, Penelope and Brendan have talked about already. But um, I really, the focus of my talk, as Penelope mentioned, is looking at um, antibiotic stewardship in febrile neutropenia and really how we balance the risks and benefits of this approach within this particular population. Um, so I'll start obviously with a bit of background and, and talking about specifically some barriers to stewardship within the cancer setting more broadly and then with particular focus on febrile neutropenia and where there are um, the opportunities for intervention to really optimise antibiotic use in this um, unique population. So I'm sure it will come as no surprise to hear that paediatric cancer patients are amongst the highest users of antimicrobials within the hospital setting. And these are results from um, the NAPS uh, surveys that Brendan has already mentioned um, that have shown that depending on the different hospital setting that up to 90% of admitted children with cancer are on at least one antimicrobial and that's compared with more of a hospital-wide approach where 40% of kids might be on an antimicrobial and on average these cancer children uh, kids with cancer are receiving at least three antibiotics or antimicrobials and that's for either treatment or prophylaxis and really this is um, because sorry moving forward um, really because antibiotics and antimicrobials have really played a critical role in cancer care and they're really supporting patients through these increasingly complex and suppressive regimens that have no, and have really no doubt um, contributed to overall improvements of survival that we're seeing in these patients. Focusing on antibiotic use in febrile neutropenia specifically, there's really this, these two sides of the coin or two approaches that we need to balance that approach of more is more um, and less is more. And both of those approaches are really coming at the patient and looking at the patient with the aim to reduce the morbidity and mortality of these febrile neutropenia and, and infective episodes. And sort of in favour of that more antibiotics is really anti, um, infections are one of the most common cause of treatment related mortality in this group and particularly in those induction phases of the acute leukaemias. The clinical signs of um, infection can frequently be masked, particularly on patients on, on high dose steroids. And um, getting in early to prevent that cascade and, and deterioration to a severe sepsis multi-organ failure is really critical for these patients, as it is for every patient, but particularly cancer patients, because once the child's admitted to intensive care, there's going to be the subsequent um, impacts on renal function, et cetera, and, and also delays in chemotherapy. And, and ultimately, these kids really need to get through their chemotherapy courses quickly to cure their cancer. However, we're all very aware of the direct um, adverse effects of antibiotics in this population but, and, and children more broadly. And there's some really interesting data emerging on the impact of microbiome, um, 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 cancer treatment response in these patients. And as antimicrobial resistance is increasing worldwide, it is particularly increasing in the haematology oncology population. And a review that we did a few years ago showed that prior antibiotic exposure is one of the most important risk factors for developing antibiotic resistant invasive infections in kids with cancer, and they were associated with increased mortality. 
So in addition to balancing those um, uh, sides of reducing morbidity and mortality, we also really need to balance that those very fixed views that people have on both sides of that equation. And a lot of these is often driven by anecdotal experience and particularly, um, you know, when we're dealing with um, our oncology colleagues, many of these particular comments and things will be very familiar to us. And for most part, you know, these are really true. They, they are very good at identifying their patients at risk um, and their patients are often the most unwell in the hospital. And there are certainly times where they do need to escalate to more antibiotics, but not always. So in addition to those barriers to antimicrobial stewardship in febrile neutropenia, that increasing um, patient complexity, that diagnostic uncertainty and impaired inflammatory response and perceptions and attitudes, there are um, also um, amongst a lot of hospitals some um, if issues with re, uh, um, funding and resourcing appropriate antimicrobial stewardship teams. And this can lead to a um, perceived or real lack of expertise in this, in this um, particularly um, unique population. And that can uh, perpetuate that cycle of reduced confidence in the recommendations within the antimicrobial stewardship programs. Some additional um, barriers to antimicrobial stewardship in febrile neutropenia that have been identified in adult and paediatric surveys are really fundamentally as um, ID clinicians and AMS teams, we don't have prescribing authority for these patients. And there's often a mismatch between what's recommended in their cancer chemotherapy trial protocols and what might be recommended in local guidelines. And so um, taking all that into consideration, it can sometimes feel like a really bit of a battle between both sides, um, but certainly I wouldn't want to take on Emma Wiggle disguised as Batgirl in knee-high boots. So just thinking about the febrile neutropenia journey and these, um, and what I mentioned earlier about what are the opportunities to intervene, I guess, along, along this journey to optimise antimicrobial use. And for many of our patients with febrile neutropenia, it's really important to think about this because those high risk patients, such as the, the kids with acute myeloid leukaemia might go through this febrile neutropenia journey multiple times during the course of their cancer care. And so these interventions that we can make along the way can have huge impacts on their overall cumulative exposure to antibiotics. So starting first with initial management, and this will um, be pretty obvious to most people that, we, you know, that there's some common principles, basic principles that we need to take into consideration about adapting local guidelines, focusing on syndrome recognition, and, and have paying particular um, uh, attention to those add-on antibiotics like aminoglycosides. But in more recent years, a lot of those principles of initial management have really been overshadowed by this drive of um, time to first dose antibiotic and getting that antibiotic um, in within the first hour. And whilst that is a really important component of management of febrile neutropenia, it's not the only component. And it can lead to unintended harms in this population, but also in more um, broadly in children in that acute set as management. So just um, have taking a step back and having a think about how we approached um, management of fever and neutropenia at an adult hospital at Peter Mac, and this is some work that was led by Kaz Thursky at Peter Mac and with the, the ID and um, pharmacy and um, health economist team linked into her research group. And it's really having a think about, we knew we wanted to improve febrile neutropenia management in um, this cancer hospital. But when we had a look at what was ha happening to those patients with FebNut, we really it became very apparent that we couldn't, we didn't just need to focus on that syndrome, rather that um, rather needed to um, give some attention to the whole management of infection and fever in patients with cancer. And so we looked at what was happening across the hospital, what were the gaps in knowledge, we made sure we um, included the key people in the co-design of this program and along the way we made sure that we um, included those core antimicrobial stewardship principles within the guideline, really to avoid that collateral damage of just focusing on time to first dose. So whilst it's a bit of a busy slide, I just really wanted to draw your attention to um, some results of our gap analysis 
gap analysis that we did. And really one of the key things that became apparent were these patients were presenting with fever, infection or febrile neutropenia across multiple aspects of the hospital and outside that traditional emergency department or inpatient ward setting. So radiotherapy, day medicine, pharmacy, et cetera. And there were um, a lot of vari variation in practice happening within the hospital. And we talk about variation in practice across states or the country, but even within a hospital, there can be quite a bit of variation. And that there were just um, availability of the tools to try and manage sepsis or febrile neutropenia in these patients were lacking in many sites. So based on, on all that, we put together um, a, a sepsis pathway that included febrile neutropenia management. And this is a nurse-led um, pathway at, at Peter McCallum. It's embedded into the medical record and uses an early warning SIRS-based criteria. Whilst we were really interested and wanted to look specifically at time to first dose antibiotic and improve our early administration of antibiotics, it wasn't the only outcome measure that we were interested in. We also wanted to make sure the process and the investigations of these patients um, were appropriate. And there's a lot of focus in, it, in the guideline on ensuring the appropriate blood cultures, blood gas, and, and the right antibiotic for the right indication and the right doses, et cetera, as well as standard fluid um, sepsis management. The outcomes were um, really quite um, uh, pleasing for the patient, this patient population. We had a significant reduction in patients admitted to ICU, intensive care length of stay, hospital length of stay, um, translating to healthcare costs, but most importantly, a significant reduction in mortality in patients um, before this intervention and after this intervention. And just remember that this is adult data, hence those high mortality rates there. And this program um, is being scaled up or has been scaled up across Victoria and continues throughout multiple different hospitals. So what about that, um, those add-on antibiotics that I mentioned earlier? And Brendan um, has mentioned this um, study earlier on in his talk. And these are, um, so aminoglycosides, um, just to take a step back, are recommended still in a lot of different guidelines for certain um, situations in the management of febrile neutropenia. And it, it's typically um, for patients with severe sepsis or inpatient on set febrile neutropenia where there might be concern about higher rates of antimicrobial resistance. But those potential adverse effects of the, these agents are well recognised in adult febrile neutropenia with a Cochrane review um, back in 2013 actually showing an increased uh, risk of infection related mortality in patients that receive these aminoglycosides. And it's possible that we've been underestimating the potential adverse effects of these agents in the um, paediatric population. And this is a study that Brenda mentioned earlier um, based on data from the Australian prospective febrile neutropenia study, the PICNIC study, where we recruited um, patients across um, all eight tertiary paediatric cancer centres that uh, showed 30% had an aminoglycoside within the first 12 hours of febrile neutropenia. And that composite outcome of either going to ICU, having a relapse of of infection laid on set severe sepsis or death um, was almost four times higher in the patients that had received that aminoglycoside. And um, once, once we looked through these results, none of the researchers involved in this study really believed them. And we kept wanting to go back and, and re-look and re-look and re-adjust um, for potential confounders. Um, and th this, um, this association really remained apparent after we adjusted for site, age, how sick they were when they presented, thinking that the sicker kids got the aminoglycosides and that's why they did worse. But it didn't seem to be the case entirely. So just um, thinking about the sepsis pathway at Peter McCallum that I mentioned, that really to balance that, um, the benefits of the early recognition and treatment to avoid sepsis complications with that over-treatment and antibiotic complications. And just, I think, the importance of being aware of things that can really tip the scale if, if there's a sole focus on time to first dose antibiotic. And um, certainly there's some centres around the world that have penalties associated with um, times that blow out beyond one hour. Those fear and what-if scenarios that can perpetuate that and limited AMS resources. And um, to try and really um, counteract that, we, as I mentioned, embedded AMS principles into the guideline at really every step of the way. So the patients, as, as some, and some examples, there was pre-authorization of the antibiotics, but after the first dose was able to be given, there was regular post-prescription review um, and feedback to the prescribers. And we also embedded not only 
only um, IV oral switch options and, and de-escalation options into the guideline, but uh, referral pathways into the guidelines. So recommendations for ID review if the patient was on antibiotics or had resistance, early ICU review, and also surgical reviews and things for um, patients that might need source control. So moving on to diagnostics now. So these are data from the um, paediatric data um, of the causes of febrile neutropenia from paediatric European studies uh, from the 80s and 90s. And as you can see, back in the 80s and, 80s and 90s, over half of children with febrile neutropenia didn't have a cause of their um, fever identified. And if I overlay the causes of febrile neutropenia from the Australian picnic study, which was data collected in 2017 across Australia, you can really see um, on that fever, uh, fever of unknown cause, um, component, really not much has changed with over half of kids not having a cause. There has been a shift in the type of infections we're getting, whether they're a bacteremia or a micro or clinically documented. But really, um, what I think this highlights is that there is an urgent need to improve our pathogen exclusion or identification. And that's looking at you know, standard diagnostics and um, hopefully as moving forward, um, the role of rapid diagnostics and novel biomarkers. So just first, of, with, uh, I wanted to quickly mention these two studies looking at blood cultures and time to positivity in blood cultures from the time it was collected to the time that you get the first flag of a gram positive or negative organ in the blood culture. So these are an adult study of 850 patients with febrile neutropenia that had a positive blood culture and the median time to positivity was 12 hours and reassuringly 92% of blood cultures were positive in the first 24 hours. We did a similar study in our um, Australian uh, picnic cohort where we had 186 um, paediatric patients that had a positive blood culture and the median time to positivity was 17 or almost 18 hours. We had a slightly um, less num proportion of blood cultures that were positive in the first 24 hours at 73%, which may be reflected of volume of blood inoculated into blood culture bottles in children, but 94% were positive in the first 48 hours. And I think collectively these studies provide a lot of reassurance about how quickly we will identify um, an organism um, in these blood cultures in, in patients with febrile neutropenia and perhaps particularly for the patients identified as low risk, which I'll talk about in a minute, that we can really start to wind back some of our decision making for these, um, wind back the clock on our decision making. Now, rapid diagnostics obviously have the potential to augment these findings um, from our blood cultures and really speed up that process of um, inclusion or exclusion of a pathogen in the blood. And there really are limited data on the impact of these rapid diagnostics, um, particularly blood molecular diagnostics in febrile neutropenia. Um, there's a couple of studies in adult patients that have looked at various uh, multiplex PCR systems coupled with some AMS, so relatively limited AMS in these two papers. Um, um, a system, so one of them used the bio 5 film array, for instance, that what they showed, they did decrease the time to appropriate antimicrobial use, so um, adding in an extra antibiotic if a gram positive um, might have been identified, for instance, but they really had little impact on the time for de-escalation or cessation of antibiotics. So suggesting that it's more than just um, uh, identifying something in the bloodstream that are driving the clinicians to continue antibiotics um, in these patients. This is in contrast to um, a nice study looking at the biofire system in a larger, um, more varied population. And this is a randomised control trial that really had a very comprehensive antimicrobial stewardship team um, included in that, where they were able to give 24-7 advice um, based on the biofire results. It did include 40% immun immunocompromised patients, but it's not clear what proportion of those had febrile neutropenia. And what they did show, the patients that were coupled with the by five, coupled with the stewardship recommendations, that there was a reduction in the um, time to appropriate antimicrobials, but also a significant de -escalate, time to de-escalation um, in that group as well. So novel biomarkers such as procalcitonin and, and cytokines have also been explored quite extensively in febrile neutropenia and, and how um, they may impact prescribing uh, 
etc. So it's been so um, there's been so many different biomarkers studied in children that it's actually been the subject of three systematic reviews of these biomarkers and the role in fe pediatric febrile neutropenia. But despite the the number of studies that have been done in this space, they're really not standard of care. And I think that's large that um, in implementation studies are lacking. Um, Procalcitonin overall seems better than uh, CRP, and that's about as um, much as I can really say on the topic. But despite that, um, Procalcitonin guided de escalation strategies in febrile neutropenia have really shown a modest benefit as, at best. So again, finding the balance in the diagnostics with reducing time to effective treatment, early pathogen. Um, detection exclusion with that availability turnaround and cost is really important. Things that will tip the scale here are the limited validation and impact studies, that, clinic, that lack of trust and understanding in the results, and really um, a failure to see it impact the care of patients. So I think this is a really critical space to be starting to think about um, now in stewardship as hopefully we're going to start seeing more and more availability of these rapid diagnostics and to really make sure that there's microbiology representation in the AMS team, they're really understanding both within a team but more broadly within a hospital or um, a, a community practice setting of what the limitations are to the test. Is it a rule in or rule out test? And that these really need to be embedded into, particularly for febrile neutropenia, into the decision support tools and guidelines and pathways that are being used. Um, as with anything, I think implementation will be the key for these novel um, and rapid point of care tests. Uh, and I think with this study published in uh, review in journal clinical and microbiology is a really nice summary of that really important interplay between the diagnostic stewardship and the antimicrobial stewardship and ensuring that the right patient has the right test and that test is in interpreted in a correct manner and it has the, the right impact um, and change the patient's um, care. So risk stratification um, to talk about next before finishing up with antibiotic duration. So risk stratification is um, assessing a patient with febrile neutropenia and assessing whether they're low or high risk of an infection or adverse outcome, and then tailoring their care, uh, particularly looking at de-escalation of their care in patients identified as low risk and trying to, as, as Penelope talked about earlier, is to get them out of hospital and home soon. So um, thinking about that, that patient's journey through febrile neutropenia. So that risk stratification can happen really quite early on in the piece. Uh, it's recommended that people use validated clinical decision rules and care pathways to manage patients. And um, again, data from the Australian Picnic study shows that up to 40% of children with febrile neutropenia presenting to the emergency department will be classified as low risk and eligible for home-based care. So in Australia, we use um, more recently, again, from results from the Picnic study, a rule called the Oz rule and it's been shown to significantly reduce length of stay in children managed with febrile neutropenia with no adverse events. And some earlier pilot data that we've um, collected at the Children's Hospital showed significant cost benefits of this and that we're in the process of scaling this program nationally. Similarly, there's um, very similar findings in adult patients with reductions in length of stay no adverse events and significant cost savings. And we do have toolkits, implementation toolkits available um, at that website there through the National Centre for Infections in Cancer. But it really isn't just about, while safety and, and cost benefits are very important, the impact of quality upon life is also um, equally as important. And so here's, these are some comments from oncology, oncologists and, and parents of a child with cancer about the benefits of home-based care, but we also need to counteract that with the potential concerns about managing patients at home, and some of these patients are not suitable for home-based care. And really, um, as the next step after you're restratified according to a validated clinical decision rule, we need to think about that even though you might have scored low risk, what is this additional safety net criteria that we can um, include to ensure that patients really don't slip through the cracks? And this is an example of the paediatric febrile neutropenia safety net criteria that we wouldn't send patients home with very active cancer or in, in high risk induction phase of their treatment. And obviously some um, no brainers there with um, confirmed locus of infection needing inpatient care. And it, this is a very similar process is used in the adult patient population as well. So moving on now to antibiotic duration. Um, so there's really two schools of thought about how long to continue antibiotics, particularly in this high risk group. It's that 
continue antibiotics um, until neutrophil recovery. It's usually somewhere around um, 0.5 or 500 or longer um, as clinically uh, necessary. And it's versus that stop antibiotics when they're afebrile for more than 48 hours, irrespective of their, their neutrophil count or um, expected duration of neutropenia. So thinking about um, adopting that first approach of continuing until count recovery can really see um, antibiotic durations blow out in patients that don't have a documented infection and seem to be otherwise well after their resolution of fever in the first day or so. And these are data from the picnic study, again, showing median durations of up to 12 days in patients with acute myeloid leukaemia. However, despite febrile neutropenia being one of the most common complications of cancer care, there's really very limited data for either of those two approaches. In fact, there's only eight randomised controlled trials comparing those two short course versus the long course or standard of care. Only two have been published since 2000. Um, surprisingly, children are actually very well represented in six studies, six of these eight studies, which is um, usually the opposite in many um, studies of antibiotic durations. But there's only really one study that focuses on high risk patients, and that's high risk adult patients. Despite those limitations, there are differences in mortality between two groups, um, and, and hope, thank goodness, fewer antibiotic days, but really only. Uh, modestly reduced used antibiotic durations in a short course arm. Although there's only eight randomised control trials, there are a number of observational studies looking at similar approaches. So either, and I've grouped these here into more of a step-down approach where you've gone from very broad spectrum down to standard um, febrile neutropenia antibiotics or secondary prophylaxis um, versus that stop irrespective of um, a neutrophil count. And these actually have included many more high risk patients and collectively they really do show no difference in recurrence of fever, admissions to ICU or mortality in the shorter course or less um, broad spectrum course versus the stand standard of care. What about primary prophylaxis as um, I'm finishing up just the final few slides. This is the most recent um, review of all antibiotic prophylaxis really to prevent with the idea that these are used to prevent these febrile neutropenia episodes. Um, and these are data in this table of just on the fluoroquinolone use, which are, tend to be more commonly um, used for antibiotic prophylaxis. And this is excluding the Bactrim that we use for PJP. Um, there are 113 studies all up, of which only 13 include paediatric or, or just paediatric studies. And, and the data here is for fluoroquinolone. And what the combined data is for shows that there is a reduction in bacteremia, fever and febrile neutropenia episodes in patients treated with the fluoroquinolone as prophylaxis, but no different in infection related or all cause mortality. And not surprisingly, an increase in fluoroquinolone resistance in the patients that are receiving these. And it's really a big fat unknown of what it does to the microbiome and antibiotic resistance within these patients and more broadly within the hospital. Um, but I think that that's a really concerning um, aspect of, of antibiotic prophylaxis use. What it is important to be aware of, that these are data that have stratified levofloxacin, which is not available in Australia, and as a more broader spectrum fluoroquinolone to the ciprofloxacin that we um, use more commonly in Australia. And it shows that that benefit on reduction in bacteremia, fever and febrile neutropenia is significant for levofloxacin, but um, loses significance for the ciprofloxacin group. There are only a few studies included in those. Um, clostridioides difficile, um, uh, is another kind of unintended consequence that we worry about with antibiotic use and particular anti um, fluoroquine of oil prophylaxis use. And the pooled data from these studies, although there was only three that looked at this, did show that there was no um, significant difference in um, rates of C. difficile. These are data um, from an observational study um, led by Josh Wolf, who's an Australian working over at St Jude's um, of children receiving levofloxacin and uh, prophylaxis in induction therapy for ALL. So it's a very intense um, phase of treatment at the beginning of ALL. And what they showed that overall antibiotic exposure increased, not surprisingly, when you were given levofloxacin and prophylaxis for a month, but it did result in a reduction in fever, neutropenia, bacteremia and bacterial infections and a reduction in cephalosporin, vanc and aminoglycoside exposure. And interestingly, they also showed a significant reduction in clostridium, clostridioides difficile infections in these patients as well compared to patients 
that weren't received, that didn't receive any prophylaxis or a non levofloxacin prophylaxis regimen. Remembering that this is observation on RCT level data though. So finding that balance between the benefits and the risks of duration, and again, thinking about what can tip the scale is those um, you know, knowledge gaps and those very fixed views about um, we need to continue until count recovery. And I think a lot of that is driven by really the absence of RCT level data in that, um, in that fa um, space, particularly in the high risk groups. And therefore, um, we're, we're really unable to make firm recommendations in international guidelines when these are written. Um, how that we can kind of counteract that some of that, that tipping of the scale is to make sure that within our pathways and, and guidelines that we do think beyond just the initial phase of febrile nutrient management management, but what's done down the track and, and putting some limitations on how long antibiotics are used for, um, really op to optimise our use of diagnostics and, and regular audit and feedback. So to summarise um, the talk, I think febrile nutrient guidelines really should encompass recommendations across the whole journey, as I just mentioned. Uh, rapid and novel diagnos diagnostics really have an important role, but should be interpreted through the lens of microbiology, antimicrobial stewardship and infectious disease lens and supported by uh, local guidelines. Similar to cancer treatment strategies, I think risk stratification should be standard of care in febrile neutropenia in both adults and paediatrics. And, and we are um, slowly changing this practice across the country in paediatrics. And we really need a collaborative and evidence-based approach to challenge those antibiotic durations in febrile neutropenia, particularly in the high risk patients. And finally, just thinking about future direction. So I think um, haematologists and oncologists have done a remarkable job with the treatment of childhood cancer. And you just have to look at some of the graphs of um, improvements in, in um, overall disease-free survival in these patients to not um, be blown away by what's been achieved. And uh, they've really done this by through collaboration nationally and internationally, enrolling as many patients as possible in clinical trials, embracing novel diagnostics and risk stratification. So they can really target chemotherapy, not just chemotherapy, now it's all the newer agents and immunotherapy to limit toxicity and improve outcomes. And I think as antimicrobial stewardship teams and ID teams, we really need to um, think about how we can embrace that similar approach to our patients and, and perhaps also to remind oncologists to think like oncologists when it comes to managing infections in these patients and, do, and similar to really embed ourselves um, within clinical trials and work out how we can embed within these cancer-related clinical trials um, implement these novel diagnostics so we can really also target and limit antibiotic to limit toxicity, et cetera. And so I think that, um, you know, we really aren't battling each other at all, as I mentioned earlier, that we really are working together um, as a team and, and perhaps the, the stewardship teams are the robin to the batman of the oncologists and that we balance them out a little bit when it comes to antibiotic use. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Gab. That was uh, that was wonderful uh, and completely illuminating. Although I think you might have been suggesting the oncologists are the darkness, which I'm not quite sure <laughs> whether you intended. That. <laughs> I have a it's question just for when you. When it comes to three weeks of antibiotics, <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you and for Brendan, um, which is about what do you think the impact of COVID on antimicrobial stewardship has been in general um, and in oncology in particular. So we, we um, uh, published a short letter um, uh, earlier this year showing that um, infectious diseases admissions to uh, children's hospital had decreased. Um, how do you think, maybe was, Brendan, if you start, how do you think that might have impacted on um, antibiotic prescribing in the community and hospitals, um, but we didn't show a decrease in oncology uh, infection admissions. So do you think it's had any impact, Gab, on, um, on uh, antibiotic use in oncology patients? Brendan. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first then. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Penelope. I think, um, uh, I think we don't know the extent of it, but I think the uh, social distancing and the the way lockdowns were done. Um, obviously, I'm I'm speaking to Victorians here who have had the most intense experience of experience of lockdown has changed the pattern of admissions to our hospital, um, but um, in different ways around the country. So, for example, in my hospital now, we're seeing a surge in RSV and other respiratory infections quite unseasonably now. 
Um, so I think that has had a subsequent effect on the, um, the busyness of the hospital and the type of um, uh, prescribing. At the same time that many of the clinicians who are key parts of the antimicrobial stewardship team are also to some extent quite occupied with COVID related work. Um, so um, uh, um, I think there have been some um, benefits uh, in terms of the way that people have um, sort of pulled together um, and the profile of um, uh, infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship um, as, a, as a concept I think has somewhat um, lifted, but also um, people have been really busy, tempers have been frayed, um, and so I think there have also been some, um, some problematic aspects. Thank you. Um, I guess speaking to the febrile neutropenia experience across the country, we've actually just completed a survey looking at this specifically in paediatric patients regarding and the implementation of the low risk program. I think firstly, there's been, particularly in the centres that have had, and states that have had the harder lockdown, there's definitely been a reduction in presentations of the um, syndrome to hospital. There was a concern initially that that might've been delayed presentations, but um, anecdotally, and we're looking at this more formally, there hasn't been a um, rise in adverse outcomes. So uh, suggesting that patients are not um, higher risk patients are not delaying coming in. I think they're just not, they just were not getting the circulating viruses that we see, particularly in winter. Um, we may, this may change as things open up, as Brendan just alluded to then, um, seeing things kind of rebound back. Um, so that's the first thing that there, there were some interesting findings, I guess, thinking about um, the implementation of the low risk program. And I guess just also speaking to the question in the chat box as well about barriers and enablers to implementation. I think COVID has been a huge barrier to initial implementation in the shorter term, but I think it's really going to open the door to a lot of possibilities in acceptance of home-based care of higher risk conditions or things that are perceived as high risk and that should be managed in hospital. Um, and um, a lot of centres around the country in paediatrics alone have looked at how they can rapidly scale up their home base and his care um, for a variety of different reasons. With, and this is all done right at the early on in the piece with the assumption that the hospital system would be overwhelmed with COVID. And, and fortunately, we've not seen that, but at, at the same time, we hopefully can um, reap the benefits of having increased HIF capacities. And I think telehealth will also bring a whole new um, level of, um, um, or, or increase the opportunity of what can be managed at home. And I think particularly with the low risk program that that's a, a great opportunity to use telehealth for those patients. So I think that they've probably, that's probably been the key barrier, redirection of resources to managing COVID. Um, I think if just thinking about more broadly, if that we hadn't had COVID, that what things that we were seeing at the, the early phases of our implementation work before COVID hit was really, I think the key barrier is just shifting the mindset of what is being standard of care practice for decades really of managing these patients and decades, it's not, it's not steeped in deep um, and, and uh, amazing evidence, but it's just what has been done from passed down from consultant to consultant. And it, that can be a very difficult thing to shift without some good quality data and which been, we've fortunately been able to get that data with the Australian picnic study and now um, it's about kind of really educating people about the safety of home-based care provided the patients are selected appropriately. So um, I used to stand on my um, let's use antibiotics at home soapbox on my own, but I think Gab might have even built a higher soapbox uh, and maybe I can just step, step off now. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, Brendan and Gab, for two wonderful talks. And thank you to um, uh, NCAS for organising this webinar series and giving all of us the opportunity to talk. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but um, I'm sure all of us would be happy if you wanted to e email us um, uh, any questions or email them to Arjun and he can he can send us questions. We're always happy to hear from people. But um, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this COVID Zoom, COVID-induced Zoom uh, webinar, and uh, uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.